Okay, so before we get into the different examples of equilibrium, I just want to go over some um, conditions that have to be met for equilibrium to be established. So we've already mentioned about the closed, um, we've already mentioned here about the closed system uh, scenario. Uh, one that we haven't discussed yet is temperature. So temperature and pressure, I should mention also. So temperature and pressure must be constant for when the reaction is occurring. So min meaning, um, if you have a change in temperature, the rate of reactions are going to change. Right? And this should kind of make sense. So if we had a reaction occurring at 25 degrees and we increase the temperature, the speed typically, usually, will um, increase the rate of the reaction because it has more energy to collide more with more energy, which we looked in the last unit. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. What you should know right now is just that the condition is that it should be constant, both pressure and temperature. Um, next week, we will look more into, well, what happens if there is a change? Uh, it doesn't mean that the equilibrium is not able to be reached again. It just means that there is going to be a shift um, and then a new equilibrium will be established. So um, actually what we consider temperature for an equilibrium is a stress. So um, a stress to the system. So for an equilibrium to be maintained, um, the temperature and the pressure should also be maintained. Okay, so when you're looking at equilibrium, it's similar to looking at the rate of a reaction. You have to have something that is measurable um, over time. So just like when we had here, right, concentration over time and looking at rate of reaction, you need something that you are measuring over time. Because of course, we want to wait until we see that there is no change um, so we know when equilibrium has been established. So it can be something like color intensity, right? So this colored gas can be an example of something that's being observed. Uh, concentration is... Uh, far, you know, far more common than anything else that we will discuss here. Uh, pretty much, you know, you may have one or two different examples that you're going to come across, um, but concentration is typically being used. And the same thing like when we saw rate, rate of reaction, typically you have concentrations. Um, pH can also be a measurement over time. We're going to look at this more in the next chapter. Um, when we're involving acids and bases for equilibrium. And pressure is a great, um, a great property to measure. However, of course, this has to be in some sort of system involving gases, because uh, if you have only liquids or aqueous uh, solids involved, you're not going to have a really big change in um, pressure over time. Okay, so taking a look at the first one, we have solubility equilibrium. So um, solubility uh, is essentially looking at taking a solute and dissolving it into a solvent. So just to recap on a couple of terms from grade 11 that you should remember. So when we have an ionic compound and we place this in water, right? So the process that occurs when this happens is called dissociation, okay? So meaning your crystal lattice shape from your ionic compound will break apart once you have it in the um, water. So dissociation, because we're gonna come across this quite a bit here, okay? So when we're talking about solubility uh, equilibrium, we're actually talking about the rate of dissociation and the rate of the reverse of dissociation. So you have to imagine you have here your solid crystal lattice, and then you have here the individual ions that of course are hydrated in water. Okay, well, eventually you reach a point where this becomes saturated. Okay, so meaning you've reached the maximum amount of ions that that volume of solvent can withhold. So we did look at this term in grade 11, right? So saturation essentially is the maximum um, of that particular substance that you can dissolve within a certain volume. So once the saturation point has been reached, the reverse will begin to occur. Now it won't look exactly like this, but usually it will look like 
you a little solid clump at the bottom. And you've probably witnessed this if you've ever tried dissolving, let's say, sugar in water or let's say sugar in cold water, like let's say an iced tea. There's only a certain amount that will be able to dissolve into your um, solvent. Any excess that you put in starts to basically crystallize at the bottom, right? It has like granules at the bottom. Now, on first glance, it looks like, oh, hey, we just have like crystals at the bottom of this glass. But what's happening is the rate of those crystals dissolving is equivalent or has the same rate as the ions recrystallizing out. So even though you have a container that has, let's say, some salt or sugar sitting at the bottom, it's always changing. Some of that sugar is dissolving into water and some of the dissolved sugar is becoming crystallized again. So solubility equilibrium is really the rate of dissociation equal to the rate of crystallization or the rate of solidification, if you want to think of it that way. So basically you have the rate of dissolving into ions and those ions reforming the solid. Okay, so um, this mentioned this, this is more in detail here. So after you've reached the saturation point, any solid added will appear to remain as a solid, but an equilibrium system is set up. The rate of dissolving equals the rate of recrystallization. If both rates are equal, which means you have equilibrium, no observable changes will occur. So you might say to yourself, okay, well, it looks like there's, you know, this clump at the bottom. It's not changing. It's not moving. It's been there for, you know, a couple of hours now. It is always changing. It's just that to the, our eyes, right, we're talking about the molecular level. To our eyes, it appears to be unchanged. So here's another example of a solubility equilibrium. Here we have barium sulfate, another ionic compound, and it is dissociating into its ions. And you also have the ions recrystallizing back. So any ionic compound has the ability to do a solubility equilibrium. Right, so any metal, non-metal ion matchup, uh, and of course that includes polyatomic ions. Essentially, it's like you're writing out a dissociation equation, except it's reversible now. That's the only difference. Okay, so phase equilibrium we saw with that uh, sublimation example before. So here we have, um, you know, for example, uh, evaporation, right? So we have liquid water becoming a gas or gas becoming a liquid. Now, especially because we're dealing with gases, this is going to involve a closed system. So anytime you have liquid water um, in a container, you're going to have evaporation occurring. Um, over time, more and more vapor will fill the space in that container to the point where it, the space is saturated with um, the gas, right? Similar to what we saw um, back here, right? So we, we would begin with no gas only the solid at the bottom, more and more gas would fill this space. And of course, once this space is saturated, it will revert back. So the same thing will happen with any phase change equilibrium. And then eventually the rate is gonna become equalized. So the rate of, looking at this example, right? The rate of, oops, pardon me. The rate of becoming um, liquid to gas is gonna be equal to the rate of going from gas to liquid. Okay, so what we're looking at here, this is actually a nice graph, um, nice picture graph example to show you. So here we're looking at evaporation. So going from liquid to gas and then the gas reverting back into liquid. So the first container here, we have A, we have liquid water or any liquid, what we're using water in this example, and the water is evaporating into a gas. So this shows you what happens when you have an open system the gas basically just floats away. So if we were to leave this long enough, what would happen is all this liquid would evaporate and then we would be left with an empty container. All right, so this is not equilibrium. B and C show you the transition from the starting 
of this reaction, and then we have equilibrium being reached. So here we have a closed container. Notice that this is a vacuum. So meaning what they've done is they've removed all of the air from this container. So basically this is just empty space above the liquid. So what ends up happening is the liquid begins to evaporate and then this space will fill with gas, right? To the point where it will fill this entire space with gas. So over time, what ends up happening is the space above the liquid is saturated with gas and it may look like, well, it's not changing anymore. The gas is filled, right? They're like, there's no more space for the gas to go. But really what is happening is some of that liquid is becoming gas. Some of that gas is becoming a liquid once again. So here's a nice graph representation. So here they're measuring, it's not concentration this time, they're measuring the vapor pressure in the space above the liquid. So what happens here is we start off with zero vapor pressure. So this should make sense because at the beginning, right, if you remember at the beginning, there was no gas there. So we started off with no gas, okay? Well, over time, here's more and more and more gas being produced. Eventually, it starts to look like, oh, no more gas is being made here, I guess. Well, no, what's happening is you've reached equilibrium. So the rate of evaporation is now equal to the rate of condensation or essentially becoming a liquid again. So this is a phase equilibrium. The same thing would happen in any change of state. Um, it tends to be easier to monitor when you're dealing with a, ga um, a gas because uh, we can measure the vapor pressure. Uh, remember that solid, uh, I should say, pardon me, not solid, but pure substances don't have a concentration, right? So um, if this is water, there's no such thing as a, a concentration for water. So you have to have some a sort of other measurable uh, quantity here. Okay, and then we have uh, any chemical reaction now. So not, a, not solubility and not looking at um, change of state, but here we're looking at a chemical reaction. So here we have um, NO2 becoming N2O4, and we can see this is an exothermic reaction, and it is reversible. So meaning, of course, this has to be in a closed system and having temperature remaining relatively constant. So when over time, of course, you would start with no product, and then over time, you have enough product that's produced that it would begin to go back, um, essentially at the same rate as the forward. So the whole point of this is that you're gonna reach a point where the rate of the forward process is equal to the rate of the reverse process. And then you have just a few more examples down here. Okay, so here we have a concept called percent reaction. So this is gonna be very familiar to what you've already known, um, except in grade 11, we called it percent yield. Um, so percent reaction is basically talking about how much of the product is produced in comparison to how much of the product you should have produced, right? So your, um, your numerator is always the actual yield, okay? So usually this is from experimental data, but we're going to go into more detail on this. And the theoretical percent yield is what we determine using stoichiometry, so we use mole ratios to figure out what is the maximum amount of possible product that we can produce. And then we have our actual yield. So when we were looking at this, right, we learned that you can never have 100% yield, right? It's kind of impossible. And there's many reasons for that, right? Purity, it could be for, you know, experimental error. But the main reason why theoretical yield will never be reached is because of this idea of equilibrium. So technically, how can you have 100% of C if we just finish saying C is going to become A and B again? You won't. You won't have 100%. Even if you have like 99% C, you will always have some amount. Ooh, that should be a 1%. You will always have some amount of this becoming reactant once again. So you will always have this back and forth. So that's another reasoning for that. 